Greetings viewers, this is Angela Murjani from Kasturba Gandhi College in Hyderabad. I welcome you to today's session wherein we are going to study one of the poems of the American poet Robert Frost. Robert Lee Frost lived from 1874 to 1963. He dabbled both in farming and in the area of being a school teacher, but he was convinced from his heart that all along his real calling was to be a poet. Therefore, it must have been very gratifying to Frost when he found that at the end of his career, he was one of the most prolific, most well-loved and most significant poets in all of American history. Frost is highly regarded for his realistic depictions of rural life and his command of American colloquial speech. His simple style of writing and constant attention to nature made his poems unique. His work frequently employed settings from rural life in New England in the 20th century and he used these as a base from which to examine complex social and philosophical themes. A popular and oft-quoted poet, Frost was honored frequently during his lifetime, receiving four Pulitzer Prizes for poetry. His poems have captivated thousands and are still a delight to read and study for their profound themes related to social and personal issues. In the poem that we are going to study today, called A Roadside Stand, Frost takes up one of his most favorite topics, and that is a strong defense of the rural population, whom Frost is convinced is soon going to be overrun and obliterated completely by the city dwellers. Now let's take a look at the poem, A Roadside Stand. The little old house was out with a little new shed. In front, at the edge of the road where the traffic sped. A roadside stand that too pathetically pled. It would not be fair to say for a dole of bread. But for some of the money, the cash whose flow supports the flower of cities, from sinking and withering faint. The polished traffic passed with a mind ahead, or if ever aside a moment, then out of sorts at having the landscape marred with the artless paint of signs that with N turned wrong and S turned wrong offered for sale wild berries in wooden quartz, or crook-necked golden squash with silver warts, or beauty rest in a beautiful mountain scene. The hurt to the scenery wouldn't be my complaint, so much as the trusting sorrow of what is unsaid. Here, far from the city, we make our roadside stand and ask for some city money to feel in hand, to try if it will not make our being expand and to give us the life of the moving picture's promise that the party in power is said to be keeping from us. It is in the news that all these pitiful kin are to be brought out and mercifully gathered in to live in villages next to the theatre and the store, where they won't have to think for themselves anymore. While greedy good doers, beneficent beasts of prey, swarm over their lives, enforcing benefits that are calculated to soothe them out of their wits. And by teaching them how to sleep, they sleep all day, destroy their sleeping at night the ancient way. Sometimes I feel myself I can hardly bear the thought of so much childish longing in vain. The sadness that lurks near the open window there that waits all day in almost open prayer for the squeal of brakes, the sound of a stopping car, of all the thousand selfish cars that pass, just one to inquire what a farmer's prices are. And one did stop, but only to plough up grass in using the yard to back and turn around 
and another to ask the way to where it was bound and another to ask could they sell it a gallon of gas. They couldn't. This crossly, didn't it see? No, in country money, the country scale of gain, the requisite lift of spirit has never been found. Or so the voice of the country seems to complain. I can't help owning the great relief it would be to put these people at one stroke out of their pain. And then, next day, as I come back into the scene, I wonder how I should like you to come to me and offer to put me gently out of my pain. Because of Frost's love of nature, he appears to be very upset with urbanization, which is causing the cities to gradually encroach upon all the rural areas of his nation. In the scene that is pictured in this poem, this is the complete opposite of what had once been. Once upon a time, the farming population was very prosperous, wealthy and contented. But now, as the cities begin to grow, the farmers find themselves much, much poorer than they were before. All the wealth is to be found in the cities. And this diminishing wealth, importance and significance of the farming community is what is making Frost extremely upset. When he sees the farmers unhappy and discontented, it makes him feel the same way too. In the poem, A Roadside Stand, Frost compares several characteristics of people from the city with people who hail from the villages. First of all, he compares the affluence of city dwellers with the very real needy condition of villagers. Then he also compares the sophistication that is demonstrated by city dwellers with the unrefined simplicity of village folk. And one of the things which really hurts Frost is that the sensitivity of village people is contrasted sharply with the insensitive nature of city dwellers and their continuous couldn't care less attitude towards people with whom they cannot identify. Now let's do a detailed analysis of the poem and find out how Frost portrays all of these themes within this poem. The poem begins in lines 1 to 4 by the poet describing a small shed that has been put up by a rural family outside their family home and on the side of the highway with the hope that they will be able to sell some of their produce to the big stream of passengers that go past in their cars headed out from the city. Compared to the fancy cars that come out from the city, this little roadside stand appears to be very crude and it is contrasted by the poet because it seems to implore the passengers in the car or to plead with them to stop and to make a purchase from this roadside stand. However, Frost does make a point that the villagers are not asking for charity. All they are doing is seeking the patronage of these wealthy, rich city dwellers. In lines 5 and 6, Frost refers to the flower of the city or the product of this industrial process, which is money. Frost claims that it is this flower of the city or the wealth which it produces that is able to sustain the city and keep it from sinking. Frost makes use of this image because as a lover of nature and as a farmer himself, it comes more naturally to him to describe money as a flower, which is a very unusual image, rather than take some other image from industry. Now, it is this flower of the city which the rural people also want to have a share in. But Frost makes a deliberate point of saying that they are not looking merely for handouts. What they want to do is legitimately earn a piece of this pie by actually selling their wares to the city dwellers. 
In line 7 to 10, the poet refers to the traffic that comes out of the city as polished. And this polished is referring to the sophistication of the city dwellers. Further, their sophistication is contrasted with the crude shed and the rough hand-painted signs that indicate north and south which have been put up by the villagers. In addition to all of this, the signs don't even point in the right direction. This does not help the city dwellers to stop at the roadside stand. Instead, it only makes them feel annoyed that all of these mistakes have been made by the village people. They have no compassion and no consideration and don't think for even a moment that perhaps these village folk are illiterate and hence they have made these mistakes. They feel irked and irritated and believe that these signs and the roadside stand all mar the beauty of the countryside scenery. In fact, they feel like these are blemishes on the landscape and they have no heart to appreciate the rustic beauty of what is before their eyes. Do the signs and the roadside stand mar the view of the countryside? Or is it the cars and the passengers rushing past which mar the beauty of the mountainside? The difference in perspective is enormous, but this difference will depend upon who is looking at it. Is this being viewed by people who are city dwellers or people who live in the countryside? The answer will depend upon that. Lines 11 to 13 tell us what was on sale in the roadside stand. The farmers had berries packaged in handy quantities, fresh vegetables and also beautiful exquisite panoramic paintings of the countryside. When the city dwellers rejected the produce of the farmers, they felt deeply grieved and took this rejection personally. Now one can only understand that if one has grown fruit or vegetables themselves. In growing produce, the grower becomes bonded with the thing that he's growing. For us city dwellers, it's very different. All we have to do is walk into a shop and pick up some fruit and vegetables. We hardly feel any connection with them. But for a farmer who has grown these with his own hands, who has nurtured those plants and seen the fruit and vegetables grow, the sadness is tremendous. And that's the reason that when the city dwellers refuse to buy these vegetables and fruit, the farmers feel really grieved. While the rejection of fruit and vegetables is bad, the rejection of art is even worse. Ignoring art is perceived as being disastrous to humanity because art represents the pinnacle of all that human beings can aspire to and achieve. If a civilization begins to look down on art, then one may consider that that civilization is on a downward spiral. And hence, the rejection of the fruit, the vegetables and the art is seen as something grievous by the village dwellers. Lines 14 to 22 describe the hurt and anger that is experienced by the village dwellers. They see in their attitude and in their behavior a meanness, a selfishness, an indifference to look to the needs of other people just because they are different in certain aspects. While the complaint of the city dwellers had been only that the villagers had marred the scenery, the grouse of the villagers was far more serious. They felt that the city folk had been completely indifferent to their very real needs. They had a need for more money and this could easily have been shared with them by the city dwellers. But in their selfishness, in their rush, they did not take the time out to stop and see in what way they could have been of help to the villagers. This selfishness is what really hurts the village folk. 
They had seen Hollywood movies in which a lot of glamour and luxury had been displayed and portrayed. And they believed that perhaps if the city folk would buy some of their wares, they might be in a position to afford some of those luxuries which they had seen on the screen. But if the city people were in such a hurry and were so selfish that they would not stop, it just meant that those luxuries would forever remain out of the grasp of these poor village people. Not only that, there was a rumour that politicians were responsible for keeping the wealth away from the village folk. So they were upset, not just with all the townspeople, but with the politicians too. Lines 23 to 31 inform us that there had been a rumour that the village people were going to be relocated in order to accommodate the ever-expanding city. Soon the growing city would encroach upon all the farmlands and theatres and malls would spring up everywhere. Using sharp irony, Frost refers to these people whom he calls good doers who will come alongside these dislocated rural people offering them benefits and by that he probably means monetary compensation for the loss of their lands. Now he uses sarcasm because these benefits would not be in the larger interests of the rural people. Initially they would be flooded with money but would this be in their long-term interest or not? This is highly questionable. Hence, the poet says that through this money, it will lead them to become lazy and eventually go to their ruin. Because in time, he says, they will give up their ancient way. The ancient way refers just to their tradition of working hard in farming all day long and sleeping at night. So these things have all been orchestrated and planned by the so-called good doers in order to destroy the rural people. Frost calls the good doers beasts of prey because they are nothing but sharks who do not have the real interests of the rural people at heart but are only looking for an opportunity to make some money for themselves. Is this situation not so reminiscent of exactly what is happening in India? Even as our urban areas are expanding and encroaching upon the villages, we find thousands of villagers migrating into the cities. Even as they have no other work to do in the cities, they're looking to sell things at the crossroads, to do different kinds of work. And city dwellers are often totally unsympathetic towards them and have little or no compassion upon them, considering that they have lost their livelihood and they have lost everything because of the growth of the cities. It's not so much that they are encroaching upon our terrain as we city dwellers have encroached upon their terrain and displaced them, which makes them now victims of circumstances. Even in the cities, they are hardly received warmly and people look upon them with suspicion and mistrust. Isn't it time we reviewed the way we looked at other people and considered the background and their circumstances before we come to judgmental conclusions about them? In lines 32 to 38, Frost expresses some of his own thoughts at the predicament of the village folk. He shares in their deep grief and their disappointment at their expectations being continually let down. Every time the farmer hears the squeal of tires, he rushes out but is faced with disappointment once again because the city folk are not interested in favouring him with a purchase. Lines 39 to 42 talk about some of the cars that do stop. But every time a car stops, the hopes of the villagers rise only to be dashed to the ground once more. When the cars do stop, it's usually to back into their yard and turn around, spoiling the farmer's grass in the bargain 
or sometimes it's only to get directions. And on some occasions, they actually stop to inquire whether they can buy a gallon of gas for their cars. This annoys the farmer tremendously because who would expect that a farmer would be there in a position to sell fuel for vehicles? What he has, they don't want to buy and what they want, he does not offer on sale. In lines 44 to 46, Frost says that business is not as lucrative or profitable for the farmers as it is for city dwellers. He feels that the counterparts to the villagers who live in the city are far better off. There is great evidence to support that this is a fact by looking at the lifestyle of the villagers. They cannot afford the luxuries and the comforts that city dwellers can, however hard they work. However hard they try, they can never afford the luxuries and the comforts which the city dwellers seem to take for granted. Frustrated by the pain and anguish of the village people, Frost makes a shocking revelation in lines 47 and 48. He feels that there is only one solution or only one way in which he can permanently put all of these village folk out of the pain and the suffering which they are undergoing and that is to kill them. This is the concept of euthanasia or mercy killing in which death is administered to those who are terminally ill or who have no hope for life at all. It was for this reason that Frost had originally called the poem a roadside stand euthanasia. He later decided to change the name around once more. In these lines, Frost admits that he was convinced that this was the only way to put village people out of their deep sorrow and disappointments. Another view holds that Frost is talking about euthanasia symbolically in that as the cities grow, they will eventually cover and obliterate the rural areas and its people completely. In other words, the growth of the city will bring about the death of the villages. So the cities will prevail and the city dwellers with it and the rural areas will die out and along with them the rural dwellers. Lines 49 to 51 conclude the poem and thankfully Frost tells us what happened when common sense prevailed the next morning. Suddenly a thought occurred to him that what if somebody were to tell him that he should die when they found him in a place of sorrow and anguish and killed him to put him out of his misery. Then he realizes that that would not be a solution and the poem ends on an open-ended note telling us that there probably are other solutions and it will be left to the future and to other city dwellers to decide how they're going to deal with this problem that confronts a whole section of our society. In conclusion, the poem A Roadside Stand conveys to us Robert Frost's distrust of city dwellers. He feels that city dwellers have no community feeling. They are extremely selfish. They are insensitive and lack concern and compassion towards people who live differently than them. According to Frost, this is definitely not a value that must be cultivated in our society and where it exists, it should not be ignored, but rather it must be addressed. Frost sees the distancing of human beings from other human beings as the beginning of inhumanity, the inhumanity of man towards man, which is the worst kind of selfishness that could possibly exist. And hence, in this poem, he helps us to confront and become aware of such feelings, even if they might exist in us, in order that we might find a way to deal with them for the future. 
Frost's hope and intention is that we, the readers, when we go through this poem, become sensitized to the emotions of rejection and disappointment that are experienced by rural folk and that we will change our attitude towards them. We will begin to understand people whose lifestyle and dwelling is different from our own and we will have more empathy towards other human beings who inhabit this planet.